Listo, profe. Muy buenos días para todos. Uh, bienvenidos al ciclo de conferencias del Instituto de Genética. Eh, es un placer para mí eh, presentarles a nuestro conferencista de hoy, el profesor eh, Cristian. Um, me quitó la, 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 eh, el cartel Mario, pero eh, Cristian voy a, el, el profesor Cristian este, Kilmaier. Es un invitado del profesor Mario Vargas, entonces le voy a dar la palabra a, a Mario para que introduzca a nuestro invitado. Le recuerdo que las preguntas las pueden hacer a través del chat de YouTube. Eh, pueden también enviarnos eh, correo electrónico o pueden llenar el formato de Google, Google Forms que está también disponible en el chat de YouTube. Así que bienvenidos y muchas gracias. Thank you, Christian, for your attendance. And Mario. Uh, gracias, Luis Fernando. Uh, since the talk will be in English, I'm going to introduce the talk in English. Uh, good morning to everyone and many thanks for attending this highly interesting and pertinent presentation called Ancient DNA, Turning Historical Collection into Genomic Resources by Dr. Christian Kilmeyer. Um, special thanks to Dr. Kilmeyer for accepting this invitation. Uh, Dr. Kilmeyer currently works as manager of the Ancient DNA Laboratory at Senckenberg Natural History Collections in Dresden, Germany. Dr. Kilmeyer research focuses on studies of ancient DNA in uh, vertebrates and in vertebrates, systematics and phylogeny of diptera, host parasitoid relationships and fossils of diptera sharing the results of his studies in more than 100 publications. Dr. Kilmeyer has recently led, together with Professor Dr. Uwe Fritz, several interesting projects tackling questions on ancient phylogeography, phylogenetics, and disentangling very old taxonomic issues of extinct and extant continental colonians using subfossils historic museum material laboratory procedures developed for degraded ancient DNA and bioinformatics. Uh, welcome to Colombia, Christian, um, virtually, and we hope to see you personally down here soon. So Christian, thank you for coming. So hello and good evening from Dresden. Thank you for the invitation and uh, for your interest in our research. And thanks, Mario, for um, introducing me. Um, hang on. Okay. So now you should all be able to see the PowerPoint presentation that I prepared. And as the title might already suggest to you, it's going to be a rather technical talk. So you're not going to see too many photos of animals, but instead I would like to focus on the how-to aspects of ancient DNA research. So how to turn historical collections into genomic resources. So which steps do you actually have to do in the lab to achieve this? And after a brief introduction, I will point out the main challenges that do exist when working with ancient DNA. And I will also focus on certain wet lab techniques that have been developed in the past couple of years um, that helps one to deal with those challenges. And in the end, then I'll give you two examples of projects that, uh, uh, that we worked on in the past couple of years here in, in Dresden. So this is just to show you where I am sitting, Dresden in the eastern part of Germany in Central Europe. And this is an aspect of the main building of the museum. Now I have to say that uh, we are more of a research institute because we do not have an, um, a permanent uh, exhibition. 
That's because it was destroyed during the Second World War and never rebuilt. So um, in this main building that you're seeing here, we are having all the offices and the actual collections, and also most of the laboratories are situated here. The molecular laboratory, however, oh, here's a peek into the into this building. <clears throat> So the molecular laboratory is housed in an adjacent building that you can see here, together with the taxidermy department, which is on the right side of the building, and the molecular lab on the left side. And uh, that's the main aisle. And if we peek or glance into the individual rooms, here just a couple of impressions um, on the top right, you can see the lab crew. So we have four people permanently employed in the lab. And on the lower right, you can see our, um, our uh, sequencing machine, a capillary sequencing machine. In the lower middle, you can see our NGS sequencer and Illumina MySeq. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's actually the lab where Mario Vargas did his PhD. And currently, we have another guy from Colombia, from the University of Medellin, who is doing his PhD in our lab. So that's the main molecular lab for the modern samples. The ancient DNA lab is physically isolated from the main uh, molecular laboratory, and it's housed in the main building that you saw before. And if you look through the, through the door, you can see two small rooms. Each room is about 10 square meters. And if you enter into the first room, this is where you change and where you do your sample preparation. So let's see, I use the mouse. In here, for example, in this little hood, uh, we are normally drilling bones or grinding bones down. And um, when we have done that, we move over to this um, um, clean hood or laminar flow hood where the actual DNA extraction starts then. So this first room is uh, for all the steps right up to the DNA extraction to the lysis. So we lysate overnight. And then on the next day, we can enter in the second room where there are also two laminar flow uh, clean benches that can be UV radiated, as you can see here. And in those benches, we then uh, finish off the DNA extraction and prepare PCR reactions, mix buffers, or set up uh, NGS library preparation reactions. And when we're finished with the work, we turn, on, uh, we turn on the UV light and radiate the whole lab for four hours to really provide um, a sterile environment. So this way we try to minimize the amount of um, contamination through modern DNA. <clears throat> so why are we, are we doing all this? Why did we spend a lot of money to set up this second small ancient DNA lab uh, instead of just working in the modern lab, which is also very well equipped and very large and there would have been space, but we decided that it's better to set up this second lab in a physically isolated building. Now that has got to do with the three main challenges that do exist when you're working with historic or ancient DNA. And these challenges are contamination, fragmentation, and low concentration. And I'm going to point out some uh, aspects now of these, uh, of these challenges. So what you can see here are subfossil uh, tortoise bones from Madagascar. And I think you can all imagine that when you're working with such material that has been lying in the soil, buried in the soil for maybe 200 years or 2000 years or even longer, 
the amount of endogenous DNA, so the amount of tortoise DNA that you want to sequence is very, very low. It's normally far beyond 1%. Um, and in contrast to that, what is in those bones is mostly microbial DNA. So you find bacteria, but also fungi, plants, um, uh, mammals, uh, right down to the, you know, the chicken sandwich the creator had for lunch before he picked up the bone without putting gloves on. So um, the, 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 the methods we're using are very sensitive and you can really uh, literally um, analyze um, yeah, the lunch of someone that picked up, that picked up the bones. Another example is this. This is a jar with um, arthropods um, from a Malay strap project. And the, the close proximity of the specimens in there also poses a serious uh, problem of contamination. <clears throat> so if you're working with such material that has been sitting in the shelf at room temperature for 20 years, um, you can imagine that it will be quite hard. And a third source of contamination are aerosols, um, which can cause cross-contamination through airborne DNA and PCR molecules. And this is the main reason why we are not working in a modern DNA lab, because <clears throat> there you have a lot of airborne DNA and PCR molecules that can contaminate your ancient samples. And in order to prevent that, we established the second lab and we also use it uh, using, using extensive uh, UV radiation to minimize contamination. The second point is fragmentation. Now, what you need to keep in mind is that once an organism dies or has died, its DNA quickly deteriorates under the influence of heat like water and oxygen. And the more heat and the more water and the more oxygen uh, there is, the quicker this deterioration pursues. Um, now, in the illustration below, uh, you can see how far back people have been able to analyze DNA in um, non-permafrost material and permafrost material. So with permafrost material, the oldest samples that yielded <clears throat> endogenous DNA date back to about 700,000 years. And in non-permafrost material, they are about at 400,000 years. Now, we here in Dresden, and I personally are not working with that old material. Um, my material or the samples that I'm working with are normally from the Holocene. So a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand years old. So that's also uh, already quite challenging sometimes. <clears throat> so this is to exemplify um, the degree of fragmentation that does exist in modern samples and in old samples. Down here, you can see a scale that represents fragment lengths. So here are DNA molecules that are about 100 base pair long. And on the right side, you have then the high weight molecular DNA. <clears throat> and this picture is from a well-preserved specimen, so extracted DNA from a well-preserved specimen uh, that is about 10 years old. And in comparison, on the right hand side, you have a museum specimen about 150 years old that has virtually or it has no high molecular weight DNA, but only largely fragmented uh, DNA molecules. Yeah, most of it below 400 base pairs. If you put these DNA extracts on an Ageros gel, uh, it could look like this on the left hand side high molecular weight DNA, and that's really good to work with. 
But if you have something like this, then you might be in for a serious headache. Uh, so this smear is the fragmented degraded DNA that is left in such historic samples. And the third uh, challenge is low concentration. Normally you do have low concentration in your samples, not the overall concentration, but the amount of or the endogenous concentration. Overall, you have normally a lot of DNA, but most of it comes from, contaminate, uh, from contamination. And this low degree or low concentration is due to the fragmentation, of course, because the DNA molecules, they fall apart and eventually they vanish, they disappear. Uh, and it's also due to the fact that curators in the museums very often are not happy when you ask them, hey, can I drill into an old bone or can I cut off some tissue from an old uh, specimen that is happened to be a type specimen of, of the species. Then very often they're very reluctant and they, they give you a tiny bone fragment or only a little bit of tissue or some scales or some hair. Um, so this also contributes to this uh, low concentration. So these are the challenges. And now I'd like to show you and tell you a little bit about the wet lab techniques that uh, have been developed over the past years that tackle those um, challenges. And I'm going to focus on DNA extraction, DNA library preparation, and on hybridization capture. <clears throat> now here's a small summary. You have to remember that all samples from historic or samples from historic museum specimens are normally highly contaminated and fragmented. And you also have to remember that almost all commercially uh, lab methods, so all the extraction kits and library preparation kits and all the stuff that you can buy have been developed and optimized for high quality medical samples and not for uh, largely fragmented historic material. So these commercial kits do not get the optimum out of your historic ancient samples. And a good example are DNA extraction kits. Normally, when you look into the manual, they say um, we can retrieve such amounts or nanograms of, of DNA uh, of a certain length. So it hardly ever goes down underneath 100 base pairs. So normally, a great deal of DNA molecules that are shorter than 100 base pairs, <clears throat> you can't extract with those kits. You can extract um, a, a low percentage, but not everything. And sometimes it's not enough what you extract. Um, so yeah. So where is the genetic information hidden? <clears throat> of course, in the nucleus of each cell, the genomic DNA, and also in the mitochondria. And I normally work with mitochondrial DNA because it's far easier than genomic DNA. Um, typically, you have about one to 2,000 uh, mitochondria in each cell. So the, the quantity of available DNA is much larger compared to the genomic DNA. And also, it seems that the mitochondria are better protected against degradation because they have a double membrane instead of a single membrane as the nucleus has. <clears throat> so this is a typical um, ancient DNA molecule. We're now looking at the typical damage patterns of a DNA. As I said, uh, heat, light, water, and oxygen uh, leads to a quick deterioration, fragmentation of DNA. And here you can see some, some aspects. So we have so-called double strand breaks. We have here on the left-hand side, a single strand break, which is called NIC. We have base mismatches, damaged bases, 
so-called interstrand crosslinks and interstrand crosslinks. And I'm going to focus um, later on on those NICs, the single strand breaks, and on um, mismatched bases and damaged bases. Um, so how do these damages or how does this damage pattern influence the actual sequencing process? If we look at the Sanger sequencing, which you all might know, <clears throat> um, you take your blood sample and you do your DNA extraction, then you do your PCR and your chain termination method after Sanger, and then you put it on a capillary sequencer, and in the end, you have to uh, check the electrophorogram, so check if the machine did the right base calling. So what you doing here is you're sequencing pre-selected PCR amplified genetic loci and the fragment lengths that you can amplify and sequence range between 70 and 1200 base pairs. Uh, and of importance is going to be the lower margin. So those 70 base pairs. That means with Sanger sequencing, you can't sequence anything that is shorter than 70 base pairs. And ancient DNA, unfortunately, normally is shorter than 70 base pairs, sometimes considerably shorter than 70 base pairs. So why can't you sequence anything shorter than 70 base pairs with Sanger? Um, and this is shown here. Um, those 70 base pairs are divided into the forward primer, which is about 20 base pairs long, and the reverse primer, which is also about 20 base pairs long. So this leaves you 30 base pairs of your target DNA. And a capillary sequencer, when you sequence into the forward direction, needs the first, let's say, 15 base pairs minimum, sometimes even more, to get the signal right. So the first 15 base pairs of your sequence, uh, you cannot use. The quality is too bad. The signal is too high. The base calling doesn't work. The same is true for the reverse sequence. So when you use the reverse primer for sequencing, also then the first 15 base pairs, you can't use. But if you put them together, uh, you get, um, hopefully a good sequence of 30 base pairs. So that's the reason why with Sanger sequencing, you can't sequence anything shorter than 70 base pairs. That doesn't apply to next generation sequencing. There is no lower limit. There's an upper limit, but no, no, no lower limit. Um, and here's why. So, Let's presume you're taking your, your sample and you do your extraction. And then you have to convert your DNA molecules into DNA library molecules. And you're doing this by ligating adapters to both ends of your DNA molecules. And these adapters also have indices here index two and index one, which you need to unambiguously identify your sample later on when you do um, your analysis and your bioinformatics. So this step is, is essential with NGS, this conversion from DNA molecule into library molecule. And then you bring everything on the sequencing machine and eventually you do your data assembly by using bioinformatic tools. Um, yeah, here's a brief summary. So the shared DNA is built into DNA libraries, which are then sequenced. We use an Illumina MySeq, which allows a maximum read length of 600 base pairs. So that's the maximum read length if you join the forward and the reverse read, which are both 300 base pairs long, and when you join them, you get a maximum of 600. And the maximum capacity of uh, the MySeq is 25 million 
reads per sequencing run. Now, as you can imagine, there are manifold laboratory workflows for NGS. There's here, I, I listed some the so called shotgun sequencing, there's amplicon sequencing, target capture hybridization, Red Sea, and so on. There are, there are others as well. So, because there are so many different strategies, it's crucial to develop a lab strategy before you actually start working. And you also have to remember. Uh, that you don't, as I put it here, that you don't always need a sledgehammer to crack a nut. So you have to find a balance between the financial investment you make because NGS and working with ancient DNA does cost a bit of money. And also the time you're investing um, in comparison to the outcome, to the scientific outcome that you get. Okay, um, so let's focus on the DNA extraction. This picture you have seen before. And the big question is when you have something like this, how can I increase the quality of my lysate? And there are several methods of doing this. One is try and minima in minimize contaminations before you do your DNA extraction. Now, I'm very often working with uh, bone powder. So I'm drilling into bones and I collect the powder. And other people have suggested that it's a good idea to bleach the bone powder, to wash it in bleach, to get rid of a large percentage of contaminants, modern contaminants. I've never tried this myself because I fear that I'm not only getting rid of the modern contaminations, <laughs> But I also get rid of uh, a part of my endogenous DNA, which is true, but apparently uh, it's, it's worthwhile. Or there are things like sodium phosphate treatment. So you wash your bone or your tooth or your tissue in sodium phosphate, uh, which helps to release uh, surface bound DNA. So DNA molecules that are bound to the surface of the material. And not that are not inside the tissue. Let's put it that way. A second possibility is to increase the quantity of the short DNA fragments in your lysate. And there are various possibilities of doing this. One is to optimize <clears throat> to optimize your sampling. So which body part is best to sample? Um, for example, um, when you're working with insects, people have said that the head is not a very good idea, uh, but uh, the muscle tissue in the thorax or in the legs is the best part uh, to sample in insects. If you're working with bones, it's a good idea to select a part of the bone that is very dense because uh, the densest parts contain the highest uh, endogenous DNA content, people have found out. Another point is to optimize your lysis and the binding buffers. This depends also on your source material. So it makes a difference whether you're working with bone or with tissue or with skin or with hair. And uh, there are a couple of work groups that are experimenting a lot with those lysis and binding buffers. Apart from that, you can also play around with the ratio between your lysate and the binding buffer. Normally in DNA extraction kits, you have, let's say a little bit of tissue and then you put uh, 300 microliters of lysis buffer in there, you proteinase K, you leave it overnight or for a couple of hours, and then you put in or you add, let's say, 600 microliters of binding buffer. So there the ratio is one to two. But people have found out that if you raise this ratio, then the amount of short fragments you get out um, um, uh, increases considerably. And there's one protocol developed 
by Debney et al, who not only played around with different binding buffers, but also with this ratio, and they raised it to one to 12 and found out that this is the most suitable approach uh, when you're working with teeth and with bone. Uh, you can also have a look at the binding medium. So it makes a difference whether you're using silica membrane, spinning tubes, or silica powder, or magnetic beads, and so on. So there's yet a lot to be discovered, and I find DNA extraction is uh, a, crucial, a, a really crucial step when you're working with historic and ancient DNA. So here to illustrate this is um, this self-made binding apparatus from the Debney et al. protocol. So you can't buy these, you have to prepare them yourselves. And here, just to exemplify what I've said before, we see um, on the x-axis fragment length and here the intensity and in green, we have uh, columns as binding media, so silica membranes, and in red, silica beads, and compared are two different binding buffers. So I'm not going to go into more detail here, it's just to show you that it really makes a difference um, what kind of media you're using in your extraction. So let's go to the next step, the sequencing library preparation, essential when you're working with ancient DNA. Um, there are two ways of doing this. The traditional way is the so-called double-stranded library technique. Um, if you buy a commercial library preparation kit, this is also based on the double-stranded library technique. And that starts with a double-stranded DNA molecule and then you ligate your adapters directly onto this or to this double-stranded DNA molecule. Now for uh, fresh DNA or high quality DNA, this works very good, but for historic and ancient DNA, it doesn't work very good. The conversion rate from a DNA molecule into library molecule is only 10 to 20%. So you lose most of your DNA that you extracted beforehand. However, if you use the so-called single-stranded library technique, which has been developed only a couple of years ago by a, a group from Leipzig in Germany, you can raise this conversion rate up to 60%. And this single-stranded library technique has had a huge impact in the field of ancient DNA uh, research. Um, it is a little bit more expensive. It costs about double the amount of money than a, a, a double-stranded DNA library. <clears throat> it also takes longer. And it can only be automated with very, very high effort. Uh, I personally do it by hand takes three days, uh, but it's definitely worthwhile. So what's, what's the big trick? Um, up here, we have a typically um, DNA molecule that has certain damage patterns that I've shown you before, like here, for example, this is one of those single strand breaks, the so-called NICs. Here we have phosphate groups um, that can hamper the ligation of the adapter. And this U is um, um, a deaminated cytosine base. That's a uracil. So this also happens. And in the single stranded DNA library protocol, the first two steps are to get rid of those phosphate groups because um, it can happen that the, the, you cannot ligate your adapters to the, to the 
five prime and three prime ends of the molecule and to get rid of uh, those uracils by using these two substances, a phosphatase and uracil DNA glycosylase. So why are uracils problematic? Um, it's because of this. A, a uracil leads to a, a mismatch, a base mismatch in the end. So why is that? Um, we start off here on the left-hand side with a cytosine. That's a cytosine, and it normally pairs up with a guanine base. Now, through deamination, this cytosine becomes a uracil. And when you perform a PCR reaction, which you have to perform at the end of your library preparation process, the DNA polymerase incorporates in the first cycle an adenine opposite to the uracil. And then in the cycle to follow, it incorporates a, tyne, a, a tymine opposite to the adenine. So in the end, you started off with CG, but you end up with TA in your sequence. Um, so this effect is very problematic in ancient DNA, really old stuff. It's not that much of a problem when you're working with historic specimens. So specimens, let's say, uh, 100, 200 or 300 years old. But nevertheless, it's a good idea to get rid of them. And another example here are those NICs, those single strand breaks. Now, the big clue of the single-stranded DNA library preparation method is that you denature your molecules before you ligate your adapters. Because what happens if you ligate your adapters to a double-stranded molecule like this is you can ligate an adapter here, maybe here, here and maybe or maybe not here. So you have four adapters. But if you denature them, you all of a sudden, because of this single strand break, you have two ends that do not have an adapter. And if you're unlucky, you don't even have an adapter here where the phosphate groups are. So you can't, these, these fragments then can't be sequenced because they are lacking the adapters. And so it's very clever to denature um, your molecules before you ligate your adapters. Unfortunately, um, this means that you have to invest much more work before you end up with your actual um, DNA library molecules, which you can see here at the bottom. Okay. Let's give you an example of a project we did on Alex Teroon, an afrotropical genus of frogs. And uh, what you're going to see now is um, or are DNA libraries from a formalin preserved historic museum specimen that had a very, very low concentration. So the lysate, uh, not even one nanogram per microliter, very low concentration. And this is on the left hand side, what you get when you're using the double stranded library preparation approach. Uh, and on the right hand side, this is what you get when you use the single stranded library preparation approach. Now the on the x axis, you have the fragment length again. And you have to believe me if I tell you that this on the right hand side is what a very good <laughs> DNA library must look like. So it's a normal distribution, a, a Gaussian distribution of the fragment length. And this eventually worked very well. Compared the same sample when we did the double-stranded library preparation approach, the library looked like this. And this is horrible. This is not even worth uh, sequencing because what you see here, those peaks are um, uh, primer dimers and um, 
enough adapters that didn't ligate and hetero duplexes and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's a real flop. <laughs> that's what an, an extraction blank, for example, a blank, that's what a blank looks like after library, uh, library preparation. Okay, and the last possibility of enriching your NGS library or DNA library is um, hybridization capture. Uh, it enriches the amount of endogenous DNA in your NGS library, and it's very, very potent. And it does this by fishing out your target molecules with optimized baits. And there are two ways of doing this. You can do this um, uh, on array and in solution. So there's on array, on array hybridization capture and in solution hybridization capture. What you see here is an example for on array hybridization capture. This brown, uh, this brown, this gray surface is a glass surface. So you're using sort of glass um, slabs, which are covered with your bait molecules. The bait, obviously the bait molecules have to be very similar to your uh, target uh, DNA molecule. So what you actually want to, uh, what you want to get. Um, yeah, so the more similar, the better. The divergence, there can be divergence, let's say up to 20%, but it shouldn't be more. And by doing this, obviously, um, you can then um, wash away all the molecules that did not hybridize to your baits. And uh, in that way, you can uh, considerably increase the amount of your dot, uh, endogenous DNA in your NGS library by several orders of magnitude. Okay, so we're slowly coming to the end. I would now like to give you two examples um, where, we, uh, where we applied all those optimized wet lab techniques. So the DNA extraction after DEFNI uh, single-stranded library preparation, and also hybridization capture. All the th three things that I have been talking about. And this is from a project um, of a uh, species of lizard, Lacerta viridis magnifica. And we had an old uh, museum specimen from 1896, also formal and preserved, which had a very, very low concentration in the lysid. And um, we did the extraction, we did the library prep and the two rounds of uh, hybridization capture. And we ended up with this very nice um, DNA library, which resulted from only 2.9 nanograms of DNA that we originally were able to put into the library um, preparation process. And what you can see here are the reads that after sequencing mapped onto the mitochondrial genome of a Lacerta viridis. Um, so we had for this project a read pool of 500,000 quality filtered reads. Yeah, so that was the amount of reads we could work with. And a little bit more than 200,000 reads mapped. So um, the degree or the percentage of endogenous DNA in our read pool was about 40%. Great, super. But the average read length <clears throat> of those mapped reads was only 58 base, pa base pairs long. And now remember what I told you before, with Sanger sequencing, it has to be at least 70 base pairs long. So for this sample, um, we also tried with Sanger sequencing at the beginning, but we didn't get any results. 
It only worked once we uh, applied the NGS methodology. And then it worked very good because we were able to reconstruct the entire mitochondrial genome of this specimen uh, with a very high coverage. So as you can see down here in the lower right, the average coverage uh, for every base pair, or, yeah, for every base pair position, uh, was 692 fold. So this means that every position of a mitochondrial genome is covered by an average of 692 reads. And now the story behind the whole thing. So here you can see a map of Europe. Um, with two species of Lacerta, the distribution range of two species of Lacerta, we have B. lineata on the left, and in Eastern Europe, we have Viridis. And this subspecies, Lacerta viridis magnifica, was described from the Crim Peninsula, here where the yellow star is. And we wanted to find out to see, uh, well, whether it's... Uh, a third species, or whether it's only part of the main Lacerta viridis population, uh, or what's the matter with that? And I forgot to tell you, the reason for using historic material is that this population uh, became extinct about 100 years ago, I think. So we uh, put together or assembled the mitochondrial genome, and we compared it to um, uh, ex extensive data sets of Lacerta viridis and uh, Bileniata, and to our surprise, we found out, and uh, that's indicated by the red color, that it actually belongs to Lacerta bileniata and not to viridis. So, um, you know, always expect the unexpected. There was a big surprise, and uh, how can you explain this? Now, we did, oh yeah, here's a, um, a, a small phylogeny where you can clearly see that Magnifica um, um, clusters together with Bileniata and not with Viridis or the nominal subspecies, that's certain Viridis, Viridis. So how can this be explained? Now, we found out that in medieval times, um, the Republic of, of Genoa, Genoa is, is a, a big town in Italy, it used to be a, a republic on its own. And in medieval times, they had a trading outposts and a, a colony on the Crim Peninsula until I think the 16th, 17th century. And right up to the beginning of the 20th century, so right up to the First World War, there were close ties between um, the Crim Peninsula and, uh, and Italy, or the region around Genoa. So the people actually also sent their children, the descendants of the Italians that uh, lived on the Crim Peninsula, sent their children to Italy to school. And we think or it's the most plausible explanation that through this tight connection, um, Lacerta bilineata was accidentally, or maybe on purpose, introduced on the Crim Peninsula. And it was able to sustain itself, the population, for an X amount of time, but eventually it vanished. Okay, and the second, and last example I would like to give you um, is about the Bahamian tortoise Chelonoides alboriorum, um, an extinct species of Chelonoides that died out about, yeah, let's say 1,000 years ago. And we published two papers on this species, one in 2017 and one this year. And the picture you can see here on the left is actually the holotype of Chelonoides alboriorum. And the bone encircled here is the bone that we sampled for this first 
for this first paper. And here you can see the two drilling holes. And on the right hand side, you have a map that shows the distribution ranges of the uh, extant species of Kelenoides and uh, also the, the um, phylogeographic, biogeographic um, distribution and, and uh, expansion of the genus in South America. So it came from Africa in the late Oligocene and then dispersed throughout the continent, also colonized um, the West Indies, the Bahamas, and also, of course, the Galapagos Islands. So apart from the holotype, we sequenced 10 more um, bones of this species from six islands, six individual islands. So these are the red dots you can see here on the map. These are the six islands. And the yellow dots are samples that we also worked on, but we weren't able to get any DNA out of those samples. And the white dots are fossils that we haven't been work, working on. <clears throat> so here's an example for one of uh, such bones. Um, the age of this bone is about 2,500 years old. We uh, sequenced about 6 million raw reeds, ended up with 2.3 quality filtered reeds. And of those 2.3 million reeds, 14,537 reeds um, were assembled to the mitochondrial genome. So this means that the amount of endogenous DNA in this bone was 0.63%. So it seems very low after all those fancy library or, or after all the fancy uh, laboratory techniques we applied, but it's still a good result and it's enough to get um, um, a high quality mitochondrial genome with an average coverage of 78 fold. And here the average fragment length was uh, 80 base pairs, so fairly long. And in the final sequence, we had, we only had um, 263 ambiguous positions, and the contact was a little bit uh, over 15 kilobases. Um, so this is to illustrate you the amount of, of contamination in this sample. Uh, what I used to produce this is a program called PassQ Screen, where you map your quality filtered reads, so those 2.3 million reads, against a set of predefined mitochondrial genomes. Here, human and then all sorts of stuff, bacteria. Uh, we have a fish here, a butterfly here. Uh, you see there's a lot of mouse DNA in this sample. God knows why. But there's also a considerable amount of tortoise, endogenous tortoise DNA in the sample. <clears throat> and here are uh, the distribution of the mapped reads, as I said, the average fragment length of it was 80 base pairs long. So you get some that are shorter and also some that are longer, of course. And here is the assembly overview of the uh, mitochondrial sequence or of the scaffold um, uh, that we assembled. So the distribution of the reads, every Every little um, dot you see is a is one of those fourteen thousand five hundred and thirty seven um, sequenced reads, and the distribution over the mitochondrial is very heterogeneous, but that's normal. So you get regions that are not as good covered, and you get regions that are very highly covered. But that's it's, it's always like that. 
when you're working with, with old DNA. Um, of course, we also put the results that we got into a, uh, a phylogenetic, re uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, and we also calculated a molecular clock. And now let's focus on the target species of Chilonoides albuviorum, which you can see here. That's the phylogeny, that's the molecular clock. And you can see that the, um, the genetic diversity or yeah, the genetic divergence or the ge genetic distance is very shallow, very small. Um, it's comparable to the, 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 the Galapagos tortoise complex. Yeah? Down here we have Cranoides hilensis, which is the closest neighbor to those two uh, species. Uh, and within Chilonoides alboriorum, we could detect two subclades, one up here in yellow and the other one down here in blue. And what is striking is that you find uh, representatives of both subclades on the same islands. So here, for example, on Great Abaco, you find one specimen in the yellow clade or subclade and one specimen in the blue subclade and also for crooked island you find representatives in both clades so how can this be explained here on the right uh, you have the the ages of the bones yeah and we think that it can be explained in two ways either the tortoises uh, themselves did some sort of high, uh, island hopping, so migrated from one island to the other and back over the millennia. Um, or it's because of human activity that those tortoises got actively transferred from one island to the next. And if we have a look down here at the colonization of the West Indies and the Bahamas by modern humans, uh, which took place about 1,000 to 1,200 years ago from north to, uh, from south to north. Um, it's actually very probable. I mean, up here, Crooked Island, those two bones are about 2,500 years old. So they, those animals clearly lived on Crooked Island um, before there were only, uh, before there were any, any humans around. Yeah. And whereas the specimen from Greater Baco um, lived about 900 years ago. And it's also, Greater Baco is also down here. So here, the possibility is given of very high that humans uh, transferred actively the tortoises with, or, or, or dispersed the tortoises between the islands, uh, carrying them on their boats or rafts as, um, as uh, uh, food, basically. Yeah. And the distance uh, between Abaco, I um, should have shown you this earlier, Abaco is up here in the north and Crooked Island is more in the south. So it's about 400 kilometers, the distance uh, is about 400 kilometers. So this makes it more likely that I think that humans transferred um, um, the tortoises or dispersed the tortoises between the islands than that the tortoises themselves sort of um, hopped from island to island. Okay, and as a, a final message, <laughs> I heard um, before, before the talk that uh, people at the University in Bogota are also starting to work on ancient DNA. Um, I'm very happy to hear this. And um, here on the map, you can see, um, or you can get a, a brief um, impression of how many uh, molecular laboratories do exist worldwide that actually work with ancient and historic DNA. 
So most of them are located in Europe and North America and hardly any uh, are in South America. Um, in this database, there's one in Chile. And as I've learned, um, there will be an additional one in Bogota in Colombia soon, hopefully. And um, if you're yeah, really thinking of getting involved in this kind of research and diving deeper into, into the matter, I can really recommend this book, Ancient DNA Methods and Protocols, that covers actually everything you need to know when you uh, want to set up an ancient DNA lab and start uh, working uh, with these kind of samples. So um, that's all from me. Um, I would like to say one more time, thank you very much for the invitation and for your interest in our kind of research. And of course, I'm happy to answer any kind of question that will uh, come up now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christian, for such an interesting talk. Um, we have actually questions. Uh, um, um, le recuerdo a la gente que puede hacer sus preguntas a través del chat, a través del Google Forms que está ahí en la página del chat de YouTube. Y también enviándonos un correo electrónico a bioinfo y genra ahí al piso boc arroba unal punto edu punto co. So this question from Julian Mora, he asks, what are the major differences in working with ancient animal DNA as compared to ancient plant DNA? Ooh, I can't tell you, I, I have to admit, because I've only been working with uh, animal DNA so far and not with plant DNA. Um, there, I'm sure that there might be specialized protocols uh, for, for, for plants, um, but um, I can only suggest uh, that, you know, the book that I just showed you, have a look in there and <laughs> hopefully you'll find out. Um, sorry, I've never, I've never worked with, with ancient plant DNA so far. Christian, I have a question, uh, yeah, and it's related to the sequencing techniques. Um, these single molecule sequencing techniques, such as nanopore of, or ion torrent sequencing, is it a, a good approach or has been been tried to ancient DNA? As far as I know, it hasn't been tried because um... I mean, nanopore technology is, is part of the um, third generation sequencing, as people coined it. And with this new development, people are trying to enlarge uh, the DNA mole or, or yeah, enlarge the length of DNA molecules that can be sequenced. When you're working with fresh um, DNA, it's not very satisfying if you can only get sequence read lengths up to 600 base pairs with NGS, with Illumina technology. So for those um, high molecular DNA samples, nanopore technology is um, a huge advance, uh, advancement. But for ancient DNA, you know, the fragments are so small, um, I don't know if, if, it, if it gives you an advancement, if you try and sequence them with the nanopore technology. I haven't been reading anything about it. It's also okay. new still, but I, I would doubt that it gives you an advantage. There's, there's reports showing that they can recirculate the DNA and concatenate several of those and use the, these uh, single molecule sequencing techniques to, to get longer fragments, but just a, a, a report yeah. that I just read a few days ago. Okay. Well, we have another question um, from Mauricio Rey. He asks, um, 
before placing strong demands on processing the ancient human sample, uh, many scientific articles were published. Uh, should we doubt its results? Uh, would it be the same in all animal samples? I guess he is referring to previous, previously uh, uh, technological approaches versus the new approaches. Um, is, is there a big difference and should we doubt the previous results? Um, hmm. I would say not necessarily, but doubting is never a bad idea. Um, I myself have used older gene bank sequences, also of entire mitochondrial genome that have been assembled uh, like 20 years ago or so. And I found that there are occasionally, um, let's call them sequencing artifacts in those uh, sequences. So may it be microbial DNA fragments that sneaked in uh, and that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, it always it, it, it also depends on the the amount of, of of care that you that you use when working with your sequences. You, as a general rule, you have to be very critical when um, screening the, the results that you get from the machine, whether they are whether you get them from a Sanger sequencing machine or an NGS machine. Uh, a certain amount of skepticism is, is, is always good in this respect. And I think that also goes for um, DNA sequences or genomes that were published in the past. Um, of course, you shouldn't dismiss everything per se, um, but, you know, have a critical, critical view on the things and then um that already helps thank you there's another question this is from angela suarez that i presume you oh. remember oh, yeah. her uh, she said that it's a great pleasure to see you again and thank you very much for the talk and she's she asked um whether in your experience, it has been easier to obtain ancient DNA from fossils than from formerly preserved museum species. How damaging is it that to DNA, uh, the formalin? Yeah, that's also a big, a big topic. Um, I mean, as you've seen before in the two examples where I used historic formerly preserved museum specimens, um, the frog and the, the lizard, if that material had been uh, preserved in ethanol, the double-stranded DNA preparation technique would have been enough to sequence those specimens uh, success, uh, uh, with success. Um, but as I showed you, the double-stranded here with the formerly preserved specimens, the double-stranded method didn't really work and I had to use the single-stranded method. So the extent of damage produced by formalin is uh, rather big, I would say. I. I think it's it's still not fully understood uh, what the formalin actually does to the DNA. Um, I know that there are a couple of research projects running at the moment, um, but it's definitely true that it's not good for the DNA. And I know that if you if you try and Sanger sequence formalin preserved specimens. 
very often uh, you're not you're not really success, uh, successful even if you're targeting small uh, small fragments in your PCR reactions. Thank you, Christian. There's another question from uh, Juan Pablo Hurtado. He asks whether to take samples from formally preserved specimens, would you go for the bone? I guess probably you understand that better than I. You mean if you have a formally preserved lizard, for example, would I rather take a bone fragment than a tissue sample? Well, good question. That might be it, yeah. I mean, um, Juan Pablo, try it out, and I'm sure you can publish the results very good, and people will be keen of, uh, of reading this, finally, <laughs> of this comparison. That's a good advice. Yeah. <laughs> Mario, uh, do you have any questions for Christian before people uh, start to ask in again? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Mr. Fernando. Christian, uh, I, have a, I have a question, which is, uh, actually, I want to frame it in a, in a broad uh, comment, and is that here in Colombia, we have a, um, one of the most important biological collections in, in Latin America, in Latin America. And this means that we have a great amount of information in, in, hidden inside this, this, um, these thousands of millions of individuals. So my question is that, do you, do you think that these methods will be cheaper in the future? I mean, do you think that your, your team in your lab will eventually develop a kit that we can use and we can, we can make it cheaper? Or, or definitely will be something that uh, will be so complicated and, and expensive because it's still very expensive. Thank you, Christian. Uh, let's put it that way. Since those techniques that I presented, the DEBNE extraction protocol and the single-stranded library preparation protocol, have been um, introduced in 2013, there has been a considerable amount of, um, uh, how do you say, of advancement. So now it already has become cheaper because the protocol has slightly changed in those seven, eight years, in the past seven, eight years. And as I mentioned, it's now already possible to use the single-stranded library prep technique on a larger scale, so to automate uh, this technique. That means that you don't have to invest so much uh, money for manual labor anymore. I could very well imagine that in, you know, in 10 or maybe 20 years, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's going to be much easier and also um, less expensive to, uh, to conduct such studies. I mean, that's, that's uh, the trend, you know, people, do spend a considerable amount of of money to opt or money and time to to optimize those um, those protocols. At least the people that are working with them, especially the the group in in Leipzig. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Mm. Christian. We have a question from one of our professors. Humberto Arboleda, and he has a very important collection of human fetuses, uh, which are embedded in uh, formalin. So he asked whether there's, uh, what would be the best methodology with samples with those human fetuses embedded in formalin for several years to obtain uh, high quality DNA? High quality DNA, that's going to be difficult. Um, it always depends what, what your research question is. 
Um, I mean, if you want to preserve this material uh, per se, without uh, conducting any specific research question, I would recommend, you know, to take a tissue sample and put it in absolute ethanol and store it at minus 80 degrees Celsius for the time being. Um, but if you have a specific research question already in mind, then, you know, one would have to look at that and then select the appropriate methodology. But it's definitely not a bad idea to conduct such a single stranded library preparation approach in any case. We have a question from Paola Pulido. Uh, she thanks you for the talk and asks whether would you need a reference genome for the species of interest in your research when also working with ancient samples of the species? And a second question is for the lizard study you presented, is there a way to test levels of integration between these species with the da data you have? Okay, the first question would be bioinformatics, I would say. Um, yeah. Um, they are, um, it depends on the assembling software that you're using in your analysis of the sequence reads. Uh, for some assemblers, uh, yeah, it's or let's put it that way, it's definite, if you don't want to do a de novo assembly, it's definitely a good idea to have um, a sequence that is very similar to the species you want to investigate. What I personally use is a pipeline called MITUBIN in conjunction with an assembling software called Myra4. And this MITOBIM uh, has used very, very useful because here you can, with that approach, you can circumvent the necessity of needing to have a sequence that is very close to uh, your target species. Um, maybe that's leading. Christian, could you write it in the chat? So. So I can uh, put in the YouTube chat for everyone. Michael Bin and Myra Paul. Yeah. Um, in any case, I can also send you the literature references, you or Mario. And you can then later distribute uh, distribute them to the, the people who are interested. Or I can send you the PDFs of those uh, of those papers. Um, yeah. So that's maybe for the moment enough for the first part of the question. Uh, and the second was in progression. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I suppose that with a single mitochondrial sequence of this uh, extinct population, and there are only a handful of, of specimens uh, in, in the collections, um, I, I don't know, I doubt that you can uh, say, say a lot uh, about that. But maybe maybe Mario can <laughs> can answer that better. 
<laughs> well, I, I think Christian that um, if you have uh, if you have a, a nuclear genes sequenced and you have a, a reference of another species you believe that you you have in progression from you can you can actually do it but I I doubt that only with the with the sequence of the mitochondrial of this single individual you can detect in progression um, but um, well we have done it like this actually having in hand also part of uh, information from the nucleus nuclear information from both species for example and we knew that there is a Integration into the mitochondrial from one species to the other one, but with one sequence, I, I, I don't know if it's possible. Christian, we have another question from also one of our professors, William Musaken. He asked uh, uh, whether is it possible to find pathogens in ancient samples. Sorry, I didn't understand the question now. The connection was too bad. Can you repeat it? I guess he's asking whether in a sample, for example, an uh, ancient uh, uh, mommy samples, he can find uh, DNA from potential uh, microorganisms that, that are pathogens and that might be associated with oh. the death. Of that person. Yes, yes, you can. I mean, uh, obviously, we are not working with, with human samples here uh, at the museum, but I know there is a another research institute in Germany in um, Jena, Max Planck Research Institute in Jena, that is. Um, focusing on exactly those questions. So ancient patho pathogens in, uh, in, in human samples. Great. Thanks so much, Christian. We don't have more questions, so I'll leave you with Mario to uh, uh, last remarks. Um, perhaps Uwe wants to join us and comment on this very interesting work on ancient DNA. So Mario, thank you. Christian. So Christian, I, I would like to thank you again for, for your kind um, um, presence here. We took uh, more than one hour of your time. Uh, we had a lot of questions to make you. So you definitely need to come here whenever this pandemic is gone because we need to, <laughs> we need to sit down and speak about these things. I would like to thank you again. Thank you for your presence. Many greetings to everybody uh, in Senckenberg. And, um, and ne next, we, I hope we can see him personally next time, Christian. Thank you. Well, I say thank you. Bye bye to everyone. Thank you. Gracias a todos por su asistencia.